All right, so here we go. As Emma was saying, this is a combination of some of my favorite things, archaeology and fermenting, and she missed one, which is actually uh, fungus, because we're going to get into some fun fungus facts as well. Um, you might not have seen that one coming, but it is. Um, so just to highlight, if you are not familiar with Zoom, um, the chat feature is there in the bottom. It's a little text box, and you can click on that and um, chat away. Um, so I think we may have some folks who are new to uh, Florida Public Archaeology Programming, so I did want to give a little introduction. Um, we're a statewide organization um, that works to help protect and promote Florida's buried past. Um, so we do this through three main work areas, mostly doing education and outreach, um, but we also do assist local governments and assist the Florida State Division of Historic Resources with different programs and projects that they have going. Um, the organization's really great. It was designed with this idea. Um, we have eight regional offices. So, you know, we're spread throughout Florida. Florida's pretty big. And the idea is that, you know, anybody in the state could pick up a phone and talk to somebody who's local, who knows about what resources are in your area, who would be able to um, help identify, identify any artifacts that you may find in your backyard and um, come out to schools or libraries and do, um, do public programming really easily. Um, so before we get into the archaeology, I do want to just take a step back and talk a little bit about fermentation in general, and I will uh, fess up, I'm not a biochemist, so uh, I'm going to do my best here. Um, but fermentation is essentially, um, it's a process in which microorganisms break down um, things like sugar, starches, um, proteins into energy, and it's, this happens specifically in an anaerobic setting. Um, so it's when we don't have oxygen and it's pretty amazing to think of some of these creatures that have kind of um, adapted to be able to thrive in these situations. Um, this process does give them less energy, but it's still, you know, better than, than nothing because I don't think any of us could be able to survive and to feed ourselves um, in an in a oxygen -less environment. Um, and I also just want to um, point out that, you know, there's uh, spontaneous fermentation, which is fermentation that just kind of happens. Um, and it's not, you know, it just it's a natural thing that will go on with or without people. Um, but we are very clever primates that have figured out how to kind of create um, starter cultures. So create environments and, and situations in which we can control the fermentation. So we can, um, you know, brew the wort and put the, the yeast in and make that beer in a very specific way um, to get the flavors that we want and, and the, um, the outcome that we want. So um, zymology is the science of fermentation. So I'm going to make a plug. We are all going to be amateur archaeozymologists tonight. So um, ancient fermentation. There we go, right? Oh. Um, so there's some main types of uh, fermentation. I think everyone's probably the most familiar with ethanol fermentation. Um, and this is how we get our lovely uh, brewed beverages like beers and wines and meads. Um, it's also how we get bread. So they all use the same strain of yeast and our big byproducts are alcohol and carbon dioxide. Um, so I will just say cheers to Saccharomyces, the, uh, the greatest of all of the fungus here um, for bringing us such delightful beverages. Um, we also have lactic acid fermentation. This is where we're going to get a lot of um, the, the things that we, we think of as, as being fermented and, you know, yogurt, pickles, sauerkraut. Um, my, my sour beer here has lactic acid that's been put into it to give it some of those uh, different flavors. Um, we see acetic acid fermentation, which is where you're going to get vinegars. Um, and then alkaline fermentation, um, which really is more of a protein based kind of uh, process. And this is not as common in Western cultures. We see it a lot uh, more in African and Asian countries. So a great example would be tempeh. Um, and the other thing to note about this is um, not, you know, everything's kind of made by a mixture of all of these things. Um, so it's not just uh, always a straightforward um, pick one and that's what we're, we're seeing. But uh, a lot of times it's a blend of, of things going on to get um, the tasty things that we like to consume. Um, so why would people ferment? Why turn to this? Why do this? Um, the biggest thing is preservation. So fermentation is going to help preserve food, um, especially if you have large quantities. So if you have a huge bumper crop of um, cucumbers and, you know, you need those uh, for the winter, you don't want to eat them all in two weeks before they go bad. Um, 
fermentation allows us to kind of preserve them and, and help help them last a little bit longer. Um, and what happens is essentially things like acids and alcohols and other enzymes that are created in this process kind of prevent um, the decomposition. They prevent other pests from getting in there and other things from growing and eating and, and causing our food to, to not be what we want it to be. Um, so there's all sorts of examples of this. Um, Saccharomyces, as we were saying, is uh, adapted to be able to live in environments that has a high high um, alcohol content, whereas other bacteria and yeast can't. Um, so it is a little bit of like a survival technique too, that they're um, they're doing these things so that other things can't eat their, their food source, right? Um, and penicillin is a really interesting one. So we know it as an antibiotic that you can take, um, but it's actually an enzyme that's produced by types of mold and it um, kills or inhibits bacteria uh, growth. And so that's why we can harness it to um, treat ourselves for uh, bacterial infections, but it's actually this thing that's produced um, by, by fungus to prevent um, other things from eating the food sources that it wants. Um, nutrition is really a, another huge part of this. Um, you know, the, the fermentation process can enrich foods. It can add um, other proteins and, and vitamins and nutrients to things. Um, it can help us absorb these items uh, a little easier. So uh, fermentation is kind of similar to cooking that it's like a pre-digestion um, thing so that once we get uh, the, the foods in our stomachs and in our intestines, you know, it's already started to break down. Um, and we see this with several different types of things. Um, sourdough bread's a really great example. If you have a hard time digesting gluten, so the starch in, uh, in like wheat flours, um, a lot of times people can, uh, sourdough goes down a little better because the, the fermentation process actually starts to break down those gluten um, particles. And so uh, we, can, we can eat it a little. Um, some, there's some foods that you have to ferment basically, otherwise they're toxic and you can't eat them. Um, and then thinking about it from kind of an anthropological standpoint, um, you know, why do we cook? Once again, it's to help with digestion and fermentation could be a great alternative for cooking um, because it, re it reduces the resources that you need. Um, so you don't have to worry about gathering wood and, and creating fires, right? Um, it's something that you can, in a lot of times, just kind of sit in a jar over here and it'll take care of itself. So. Um, it can be a very cost efficient way to get really good nutrients into our systems. And at a certain point, um, people do things because of culture and we do things because we like to do them and we enjoy them, right? So fermentation gives us um, all sorts of wonderful flavors and textures and it can really diversify our diets. Um, and it also becomes part of, of cultural practices, right? So um, sauerkraut, you know, maybe sauerkraut came about because people were trying to figure out how to get um, cabbage to last a little longer, right? Um, but a lot of places now just make sauerkraut because that's part of their cultural practices. So we don't think about, you know, some of the origins of some of these things. We just do it because we enjoy it. And another big factor in fermentation is actually alcohol production. So of course we do have it for recreational use, um, but we also see, you know, it's a really great fuel source. A lot of the biofuel experiments um, are looking at using um, basically fer fermented corn to, uh, to get cars around. Um, and then there's lots of other uh, medical uses and industrial applications and you know, chemical applications and all. Um, and we see these throughout time as well. So some of the earliest um, distilled spirits were actually used for things like perfume versus consuming um, as well, you know, and, and medical uses versus uh, just consuming them, so. Um, so what kind of clues can we find of fermented things. Um, the items themselves is the great place to start, right? We can find uh, the fermented beer in the bottom of a shipwreck that's from 1840 that's still in the bottle. Um, we can find the bread that's in a tomb somewhere. We can find um, all sorts of crazy things. Uh, but all this really has to do preservation, preservation, preservation. So um, we see better preservation in these extreme environments. So anaerobic environments, environments without oxygen. Um, extreme heat, extreme cold, extreme wet, extreme dry, right? These are all gonna create um, better preservation conditions. Um, and also kind of just, you know, things that may happen uh, like giant volcanoes that go off uh, can help uh, preserve things. So we'll see uh, at, at uh, Pompeii and Herculaneum that we have some things that were preserved um, because of that, so. Um, we don't always find, of course, you know, this perfectly sealed bottle with a liquid in it. A lot of times we have to do um, vessel sediment analysis. So 
Um, it's scraping out any residue that may be in the bottom of a pot. It's um, sometimes taking the pot itself and grinding it up and um, looking at the chemicals that are in there. And uh, I like to call it science magic and my hats off to the folks who do this. It's, uh, it's really amazing work and really intense. Um, you put it through mass spectrometers and you get uh, these crazy chart readoffs like you can see here on the slide where it's showing what kind of elements and, and what's you know in basically the chemical signature. And from there you can figure out um, what was in there, what, you know, what was in the vessel. Um, and so we can get really good evidence of fermented um, goods through these scientific endeavors. Um, and there's certain markers, you know, if we find beeswax, that's a good signature that there was honey and there's um, tartric tar acid that is related to grapes and, um, you know, different kind of grains have different, um, different uh, signatures and, and, and markers that they're leaving behind as well. Um, we also see a lot of folks are doing um, DNA sequencing and, and tracking down, um, you know, things like yeast and bacteria uh, to really understand what's happening. And in some cases, we're able to like literally bring these things back from thousands of years ago and brew with them and bake with them and and um, continue to, to use them today. So that's pretty amazing work that's happening there. Um, recipes, especially where we have uh, written, you know, cultures with written documentation, um, we do have uh, recipes for, you know, baked goods or fermented goods or brewed goods. Um, Plenty of the elder writes in Naturalist Historia, who describes how they um, essentially would make yeast cakes out of starter to use for baking bread, or sometimes they would just put um, a little of the dough from the day before in there. Um, and he actually describes how you make a starter and you use um, flour and mashed grapes, which is kind of interesting. So the grapes um, would have uh, yeast on them naturally that would help kickstart um, the yeast in, in eating the, um, the flour, which is, of course, you know, how we get a sourdough starter and how we uh, have, have uh, bread baking. So, um, so we can see this in a lot of written documents, a lot of things like that. Um, one of my favorites is the hymn to Ninkazi, which is... Um, a goddess of brewing from Samaria from a, a couple thousand years ago, this, uh, this piece of, um, it's like a, a prayer, it's a hymn to her, right? Um, was written and it's, uh, it goes through the whole brewing process. Each stanza kind of talks about a different part of it from growing the grains to doing the malting, cooking the mash, you know, fermenting. Here's, uh, here's the verse on fermenting. You are the one who holds with both hands the great sweet wort, brewing it with honey and wine. Um, so we can, uh, you know, say a little prayer to an Inkazi the next time we homebrew that uh, everything will come out just the way we want it, you know. And of course, uh, you know, we see practical things get represented in other aspects of our culture, right? Um, so it's not just strictly recipes, it's not just strictly uh, tools and, and practical uses. Um, we see evidence of fermentation and of um, and of baking and of brewing and all of these things um, represented in arts. We have, um, you know, carvings and drawings on tombs in Egypt of, of baking and of brewing. Um, there's some uh, really beautiful artifacts here from Central America that show uh, cacao pods. So this is the, um, the pod that chocolate is made out of, you know, uh, there's a, a figure here holding a staff that's a cacao tree. Um, so we can see these things kind of represented throughout all sorts of aspects of, of culture. And then we can go look at the processing sites themselves, right? Go straight to, to where it's all, where the magic's happening, right? Um, so we can find places like bakeries. This is the bakery that was found in Jamestown. Um, it was a, a part um, blacksmith shop, part bakery, which is a kind of interesting uh, collection of, 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 you know, you wouldn't expect to put the two of those together, but I guess um, if you're able to, to utilize the heat sources, right, for, for more than one task, then that makes sense. Um, and then we have, um, this is a Phoenician uh, wine press. So this is where they would start the process of, of, of pressing the grapes to get, uh, to get wine brewing. So we can go to these places and we can learn about the technique, technology and the techniques that people were using. Um, and also, you know, get information about, you know, what kind of bread they were baking or what kind of grapes they were using, things like that, so. So to get to some examples of ancient fermentation, the moment we're all waiting for. So um, fermentation has pretty old origins and we find it globally, right? We see people are um, fermenting foods all around the world and the types of foods that they're making, you know, really does have 
um, depends on you know where where they are and what resources they have access to and um, you know cultural practices that they have. So um, it's not uniform across the world, but we can see uh, you know some commonalities just in, in the, the fermenting processes, right? Um, and the word itself is interesting. So um, the word that we use in English comes from Latin word for boil, but we see this is true of other cultures. There's some Chinese documents that use the word fei, which is uh, boiling, right? Um, and if you've ever seen fermentation happen, um, it does, it bubbles and it froths up, right? Just like boiling, uh, boiling water or boiling um, liquids do. So it's a pretty interesting, a good, good description um, for, for the process. And I think people, uh, you know, it took till we get into, you know, germ theory and, and you know, some pretty specific um, scientific research in the 1800s before we really fully understand what was happening. There's a lot of, um, I think plenty talks about it being like an acidic reaction that occurs. So folks know something's happening, um, but they maybe don't know exactly what's going on. Uh, and then good old Louis Pasteur um, confirms that yeast is, uh, is the organism that causes fermentation uh, in the 1850s. I think he, he identifies Saccharomyces. So. Cheers to him. Um, so just to hit on some of the foods that we find and some, some cool sites and, and places and things that have been found uh, really around the world. Um, fish <laughs> is probably not the first thing that comes to mind when you think of fermented foods. Um, but we do see fish is very uh, commonly fermented, especially up in Northern coastal places. Um, and there's this really amazing site in Sweden where they have a uh, 9,000 year old vat of fermented fish. Um, it is estimated that there are 60,000 tons of freshwater fish in this big vat. Um, and they found evidence of acid damage on the bones, which is uh, an argument for that it was fermentation and the fact that there were so many fish. Um, so there are a couple different lines of argument this there. Um, and this is still a cultural practice we see with native groups, um, you know, in the Pacific Northwest and in Alaska and Canada. Um, and there's really an argument for um, better nutrition. So of course we get preservation of the fish. Um, so if you can only go fish seasonally, you know, you, this is a way to kind of keep keep food stores along and along. Um, but there's also, you know, really great evidence that it provides um, better nutrition if you ferment the fish. So they did some um, kind of experiments where they fed sled dogs um, salmon and fermented salmon. And the dogs that had the fermented fish um, actually were healthier and, and they did better. Um, so there's a thought that this is also getting access to different nutritional, you know, like vitamins and, and uh, things that uh, some of these cultures wouldn't have had otherwise, you know, given their environments and what, what grows there. Um, milk. And I'm sure when you think fermented, you go, mm, fermented milk sounds great. Um, but we have a lot of uh, fermented milk goods that we consume on it. Uh, you know, if you had cheese today, I've had cheese, I've had yogurt, I've had cottage cheese. Um, a lot of these things actually are fermented um, cheese. They, um, they, uh, the one of the traditional ways of making it is to put rennet in it, which is an enzyme that's found in a calf's stomach, um, a calf that has only ever had milk. Um, and it's an enzyme that helps break down uh, the, the lactose. And so that it's, you know, it's an acid, it causes this fermentation process to happen where you get the curds in the way um, to separate. So there you go. Um, a lot of the thought around uh, fermented milk products is that this would help us uh, digest. We are one of the weird, crazy, only mammals that um, actually consume uh, dairy products past infancy, right? And a lot of the human population, we're still lactose intolerant. We can't, um, can't, can't digest it. So it's thought that um, fermenting helps in the digestion, right? It starts to break down those elements that we can't, the lactose or the other parts of, of it that uh, causes problems. Um, so that we think it's linked to, um, to, you know, trying to utilize milk as a food source. Once again, if you um, have seasonal issues with trying to get, get good foods when it's cold out or, or trying to um, make things last longer or, um, you know, just utilizing the, the things you have around you. Um, we do have some pretty uh, old global, you know, we see milk happening, fermented milk products happening in a lot of cultures around the world. Um, the oldest evidence we have is uh, kind of in the Mediterranean Sea uh, region here and um, it's cheese. And once again, it goes back to uh, doing those vessel sediment analysis and finding um, different uh, 
different chemical signatures that suggest um, cheese making and, and dairy processing. We also find vessels that the, the form of them makes sense for cheese processing. So these are some um, vessels from, I believe, England. And you can see there's holes in them, right? So it's perfect for trying to separate um, the curds from the whey. Uh, and it's not just cow's milk, right? We have goat's milk, we have um, all sorts of different uh, animals. Uh, kumis is a very popular uh, fermented horse milk beverage that we see going back 4,000 uh, plus years. Uh, and um, the story of this is that there were uh, kind of nomadic peoples in the Asianic steppes and they would um, get mare's milk and put them in like bladder bags and they would ride, you know, all day uh, and it'd get all nice and shaken up and, and jostled around and, and ferment and they would have a uh, beverage and they would never completely empty the pouch. They would just keep refilling it, you know, with more milk. So it was just a continuous going, uh, going production there. Uh, and then the last cool photo of, of, uh, is of some cheese from Egypt that's about 4,000 years old. So uh, I'm sure that's uh, some stinky cheese at this point, right? <laughs> um, bread. Bread is fermented. Um, sourdough is definitely fermented. Uh, there's an argument that even kind of commercially produced uh, we're still using Saccharomyces and we're getting those ear bubbles in there, right? And that's a fermentation process as well. Um, so we have really early evidence of bread going back, you know, 13,000 years. It's not leavened though. So there's an argument that that's not fermented. So I left it off of my slide and we're going to go back to Egypt where we know that it was leavened um, back, you know, four or 5,000 years. Uh, and you can see some of it here in the top right corner, these little conical shaped loaves. Uh, that's Egyptian bread from 4,000 years ago from a tomb, which is pretty cool. Um, but Egypt is just chocked full of art, of tools, of production facility, of the dough itself, the bread itself, right? Um, so there's just tons and tons of bread that's being made in Egypt. Um, it's not necessarily all wheat bread. I think a lot of what we consume today is made from wheat flour. Um, maybe we get some rice sneaking in there. Um, but there's tons and tons of other different types of cereal grains that we see that are used all over the world, um, all through time. So um, in Pompeii, we have these carbonized uh, Panis quadratus loaves that were really cool. Um, that just got, you know, when the, the volcano erupted and everything got coated, they just kind of like carbonized, but they're still, they're still there, right? Um, and they're actually made from spelt. So a uh, different kind of different kind of grain there. Um, and these were cool because we had multiple bakeries and they found a bunch of them in the bakeries and, and they realized um, that each of the bakeries would like stamp the loaves of bread uh, kind of with like their own logo or their own um, signifying mark. So we can actually kind of connect uh, bread with production sites there in a cool way. Um, and we do have some old bread in uh, Europe as well, about uh, two, 2000, uh, at least 2,500 years old. We have uh, this charred loaf from Germany. Um, and it is wheat. It was found in a, um, in a big pit with uh, all sorts of other things, pottery, and, um, and it was charred. So there might be some, you know, that's, that's why it ended up preserving was, uh, you know, if it was burnt and, and um, ended up in, in, a, in just the right environment to be able to find it. Uh, we have fermented goods in uh, in the New World. I mentioned, uh, you know, some some uh, Arctic, some northern uh, folks, but we see it in Central America as well. Um, chocolate is a fermented good, um, and so in processing the cacao uh, pods, like step, you, know, you go and harvest them and whatever, but then you have to just basically let them sit and ferment and rot for a little while. Um, and there's uh, some interesting debates going on about where where kind of some of the the chocolate culture starts, um, you know, it was long thought that it was from the Olmecs, but they found new evidence in Ecuador um, that they were, there's, you know, chocolate consumption happening um, in South America. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what kind of fun uh, arguments and discussions and, and things come out of conferences and, and they finally figure out what, what's going on there. Um, but either way, a lot of the evidence goes back to finding uh, theobromine, which is a chemical that is a good signature of chocolate. So we found that in, in vessels. It's, it all comes down to vessel analysis, guys. Um, and we see it's consumed all throughout uh, Central America by you know, different cultures all throughout time. Uh, and eventually the Spanish come and take it over to uh, bring it you know, to European cultures, to the New World, to, uh, well, sorry, not the New World, to North America, uh, to what is now the United States. 
and then also to uh, you know back to Europe. And one of my favorite artifacts from here in St. Augustine is actually um, this little wooden tool, and it's a chocolate frother. So it was used to kind of like stir and mix up um, hot chocolate beverages, which is kind of a fun thing to see. And now we'll get to the to the good stuff here, to the alcohol. Um, there's a lot of speculation as to why we start fermenting alcohol, um, how we figure it out. Uh, we know there's, you know, primates that definitely go and eat, you know, fruit will ferment on their own. So we know primates will go after and, um, and eat uh, fermented fruits. Uh, there's stories of drunken elephants, right? Um, and alcohol, once again, is essentially a, 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 an energy source. So there's uh, some practical arguments for it. And then there's also like the, uh, I think it's the drunken monkey hypothesis where we, uh, kind of just like to feel the uh, the effects of alcohol, right? And we, we adapt and we develop um, things because of that. Um, as I say, uh, grapes and fruits will naturally, they have yeast on them. Um, it's thought that, um, you know, insects, when they, when they go around and pollinate, they're also moving yeast around. And, and um, so a lot of uh, fruits naturally have yeast um, and they'll spontaneously ferment. You know, if they, if they, the, the skin of the grape starts breaking down and the yeast can get inside, then they're going to eat all those good sugars. Um, and we see this with uh, all sorts of different types of fruits. Um, honey is another one. Honey will naturally ferment um, if you put enough water in it. So I think it's about 20% water content um, and it'll just take off and you'll have some lovely bubbling, frothing mead to drink. Um, and so some of the, the conversations about alcohol consumption and, and fermentation is that uh, it's that, you know, the, the wines, the fruits, the honeys are the first things that we start, you know, discover that ferment, we figure out how to ferment them. Um, and then it's not till later uh, that we start to see beers and cereal uh, cereal grains being fermented. And I'll show you, that's maybe not true as of some new research. Um, but this is because the grains require some other step of processing, right? You have to grind them up, you have to germinate them, you have to, um, you have to do something to extract the malt from them, right? They're not just, I mean, they are full of sugar, but they're not full of just sugars waiting like the honey or the grapes. So, um, and the other thing I'll just say is we think of very distinct categories of, you know, wine and meads and beers and ciders and, um, in the past, I don't think this, those categories quite existed. And in fact, uh, what was long touted to be the oldest beverage, uh, alcoholic beverage from uh, China was a mixture of all of those things, right? Um, it had uh, rice and beeswax and, and grapes and other uh, herbal constituents um, in there. Uh, and in fact, we find, you know, Nordic rags that have all sorts of things. Once again, the whole gambit of, of anything and everything. Um, so these kind of categories that we've created didn't necessarily exist in the past. And, and um, you know, I think it would be really great. I, folks are starting to experiment with making these blends of things and um, they're very tasty. So, so um, the latest data on the early, earliest potentially, you know, fermented alcoholic beverage is actually a beer, which is pretty cool. Um, going back 13,000 years, uh, there were a group of, of researchers working in Israel and they um, found this site in this cave and they have these stone mortars that are like carved into the bedrock of the cane, uh, cave and they knew they were grinding grains in them. And so they were looking at some of the, um, the research there and, and trying to figure out what was happening. Um, and they thought it was just kind of a, a, a grain processing site, a mill or something, but they actually found um, starches that are you know, present if grains have fermented. So that was pretty cool. Um, so there's some evidence that these are, this is the oldest fermented beverage and it's a beer and cheers to that because I'm a, I'm a beer drinker. So I'm, I'm here for that. Um, but these early brews, once again, they're not going to be what we think of when we think of having a nice uh, crisp beer uh, today. Um, once again, a variety of grains were used um, and a variety of flavorings. It's not until um, the 12th century that we see hops becoming kind of the dominant uh, bittering agent and flavoring agent. Um, and really the kind of our idea of what beer is today goes back to the uh, German purity laws um, uh, from around 1500 where they say, you know, it's water, it's barley, it's hops and it's yeast or it's not beer. Um, so there's a whole, whole world of beers outside of that, right? Um, and these beers were also often thicker, they were unfiltered, right? And, and they were uh, gonna be a completely different drinking experience than I think we would be used to today. Um, just some other fun kind of beer 
artifacts and, and places and research. Um, sorghum beer is uh, really popular in African countries. And uh, here's an image of folks drinking it a little closer to the present day here. Um, but it's an 8,000 year old tradition in a lot of these places. And we also see um, you know, millet and other types of grains that folks are using um, to create these beers. And the other thing to think about with some of these, um, these older beers is, uh, they weren't um, produced and bottled and pasteurized and they weren't meant to be stored, right? They were meant to, they were made and they were meant to be consumed. Um, so we see a lot of communal practices with drinking these beers. Um, and we see that they're, uh, you know, they're consumed when they're made, right? Make it and, and enjoy it. Um, so, but we have lots of art um, in, in various places in Africa and Egypt and, and other places uh, where we see, um, you know, the drinking out of from the one big pot with these long straws and we find uh, evidence of, you know, the straws in the pots and, and all sorts of things. So, uh, and as I say, people continue these, these practices today. Um, we have a pretty cool brewing kit that was found in the central plains of China that's about 5,000 years old. Um, and it's really cool because there was like the brewing pots and the fermenting vessels and then this cute little funnel. And I just think it's the best thing ever. I love um, ceramics and I've just never quite seen anything like that before. Um, but of course, like you need a funnel to get things into, you know, constricted uh, mouths of vessels, right? So I think that's a, a fun little, a fun little, um, a fun, but yeah, just a really great artifact. Um, Germany, you know, we, we associate Germany with a lot of really delicious beer. Um, and it does have some pretty old um, brewing traditions going back about 1200 years. Um, and they found, you know, evidence of, of beer in uh, tombs in Bavaria. So right, right to the heart of it. Um, and I think a lot of our kind of more modern brewing traditions do go back to monistic, uh, mon mon uh, monastic brewing traditions that started about 700 years ago. And there's tons and tons of sites all throughout Europe um, where they've, you know, gone and, and excavated the breweries from these um, old, old uh, friaries and, and places. So lots of really cool research into that. We do have a New World beer um, in, uh, in South America. Chicha is a, it's a corn beer. So it's made um, by chewing on the kernels, um, which is uh, important, not just for breaking them up, but you also get all sorts of enzymes and bacteria and all sorts of lovely things that are living in your mouth that you don't ever really wanna think about or acknowledge. Um, but that's crucial to fermenting the chicha. Um, and there's evidence that this is at least a 7,000 year old tradition. And there's you know folks in Peru who still uh, make a lot of these beverages. And we have some really cool um, you know, brewery sites. Um, uh, for, you know, in, in places. Um, and this is probably the closest that we get to um, to fermented beverages in what is now the United States, um, is we do see chicha coming up through, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mexico and um, Casas Grandes uh, is, is kind of there. Uh, and we're, you know, near where we have put the border uh, between the US and Mexico, right? Um, and so there's uh, ceramic evidence, but there's also, they've uh, found, uh, tooth like tartar and plaque and buildup on teeth that has um, starches once again that are related to corn fermentation. So that's a pretty cool way to have discovered uh, fermentation from my, my mind is it was like the evidence is still in their mouths that they were drinking it. So um, mead, uh, you know, lovely fermented honey beverages. Um, once again, some of the, the speculation about like the earliest, uh, you know, people consuming fermented beverages and where are we going to find this, um, some of it does involve, you know, these ideas of having a, a beehive that gets flooded out with water and it starts to ferment and then people find it and they're like, oh, what is this? This is good. Um, and we know people have, have a really long history with bees. This is a 8,000 year old cave painting from um, Spain and you can see the bees flying around and she's or he's, the person is climbing up to, um, to harvest the honey out of the hive. So um, it was very popular in the Mediterranean world. Um, I think a lot of times we think uh, Mediterranean, we think wine, but this was actually more popular uh, before wine. You know, wine was not, uh, not the thing for a while. Um, so folks were drinking more mead to begin with. Um, there's a long evidence, uh, you know, folks drinking it in a lot of African countries as well. And we see, you know, it was used uh, people were fermenting honey in China and, 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 you know, it's just throughout the world, really, anywhere that they had honey. Um, one of the coolest bits of research that I read about uh, mead is that they found coprolites from a couple different sites in, uh, in some European countries. 
Um, and copper lights are fossilized poop. So they did some chemical analysis of the poop and they found, um, you know, once again, different chemical signatures that suggest that they were drinking mead a thousand years ago in, in Europe. And I think that's, I mean, what, what more can you want out of archeology span but fossilized poop and, and alcoholic beverages, there you go. Um, and wine, uh, wine's, uh, you know, a pretty old tradition as well. I think the current standing oldest site of wine is uh, in Georgia and it's about 8,000 years ago. Uh, and it's from the pot that you can see here on the screen. And I think it's great because they, they found, you know, the residual, the, they did the, the sediment analysis, right? And they found the wine in the, in the pot, um, but the pot was decorated with grapes on the side. So there you go. That's what, what it was, right? Easy to, to figure that one out. Um, the oldest uh, liquid wine. So we have 8,000 years of winemaking, um, but the oldest actual liquid wine we have is only about 1,700 years old. Um, and it's from a Roman tomb in uh, Germany. And here's a lovely image of it. And, um, you know, uh, doesn't quite look appealing to me, but maybe wine connoisseurs might be more inclined. Um, and there's just a lot, we still don't know a lot, uh, you know, we find new sites all the time. As I was saying, like the oldest alcohol was long thought to be in China. And then they found this new site in Iraq. Um, and they're constantly finding all sorts of really cool shipwrecks, uh, you know, in, in the Mediterranean in the Baltic uh, that are, uh, have these big amphora, these big kind of, um, like olive jar type vessels. Um, so one of the, the coolest sites they found recently and they're trying to figure out even how to study it because it has an estimate of 6,000 vessels on it. Um, so to even try to send people down there to hang out long enough to map all of these is just like insane. And and between bottom time and you know what kind of work can you do? And, and um, they, they finally decided to do uh, like side scanning sonar and to get really good images of it. And then to have people try to, to map and, and measure and, and collect the data on all of these vessels um, from you know the shore where there's a little uh, few, fewer things to have to worry about, right? Um, so they haven't actually looked into the Empora yet, but um, they very likely could have wine. There's tons of other shipwrecks um, that have these similar vessels that are full of wine. Um, so if, if all of those have wine in it, it would be 200,000 bottles of wine, which is, is a lot of, that's a lot of wine. That would take you quite a while to sing the song with 200,000 bottles of wine on the shipwreck. Um, so if you are intrigued by some of these uh, bottles that are found on shipwrecks, um, people are trying them, people are trying them. Um, so there's a 170 year old bottle of champagne that they found uh, and they opened it and they uh, took some, some you know, first notes and, and sniffs and taste and had animal notes and wet hair. Um, but of course you can't just open up a beverage, right? And start chugging it. You have to let it breathe, let it be in the air, right? Um, but they still didn't really come up with uh, very many other um, good sounding tasting notes on that one either. So. Um, there's a, a bottle of wine from a Confederate shipwreck that they found and they opened it at a uh, like a wine festival in Charleston, South Carolina and had a bunch of uh, sommeliers taste it and give tasting notes. Uh, so here they are pouring it, um, just a lovely shade of dirty mop bucket water there. Um, and their tasting notes included crab and salt water, gasoline, vinegar with hints of citrus and alcohol. So, um, don't worry, you too could try one of these uh, delicious, really old, weird bottles of wine. Um, recently, uh, Christie's auction uh, had some 350 year old bottles of wine. I think it was from like a Portuguese shipwreck. They may have been Portuguese wine. Um, and they uh, started at about $30,000 for auction. And I will say Christie's was smart enough to say, you know, like this is probably not drinkable in any sense of you think it could be, but um, there you go. <laughs> um, and I've talked a lot about, um, you know, cultures uh, from around the world. Um, and we really, as I was saying, we really don't see a lot of fermented beverages um, with some of the, the native cultures here in the, in the Southeast or uh, in the, the, you know, what is now the United States. Um, but of course the Europeans show up uh, ready to go, ready to party when they get here. Um, 
I'm in St. Augustine. So we were founded in 1565 by Pedro Menendez. We're one of the, um, let's see, we are the longest habitually occupied European settlement in what is now the United States. So when they throw out the slogan, nation's oldest city, that's really what they mean. Um, but Menendez shows up ready to party with 720, um, basically olive jars of wine, which is about 11,000 bottles by today's standards. So that's what you do when you're founding a colony, I guess. You bring lots of wine. Um, and, you know, some other really interesting archaeological sites that we see um, kind of involve the sugar industry that's in the Caribbean, um, and it begins to really dominate um, the industry down there in the, by the 17th century. Um, and rum becomes a huge export. And there's all sorts of really interesting historic documents about um, kind of how rum started and who like the Spanish were not into rum and called it like the devil's water. And, um, but the, the British were all for it and it becomes a huge export. And so we find um, tons of really amazing um, sites down there. And there's also interwoven into this, you know, the, the stories of, of the transatlantic slave trade and, and of, um, you know, European colonization and just so many things that are packed into these sites um, that they really just become fascinating places to research. And that's a whole other uh, conversation and presentation. Um, and then of course our founding fathers were brewers and, and made cider and, and all sorts of things. Um, so one of the best, um, best preserved and best documented still sites we have is actually at George Washington's Mount Vernon um, plantation. And so they did a lot of uh, archaeology there. I think they've reconstructed it too at this point. Um, but there's a really cool website. You can, um, you can Google it. I think I can get it in the, um, I'll get it in the chat box for you guys if you're interested. Um, but you can actually go like virtually excavate the still site. So that's, that's a really cool site. Um, and speaking of stills, there's uh, <laughs> the bourbon archaeologist, uh, Nathan Lariantes, who's done a lot of work in Kentucky looking at um, prohibition period stills, so illegal stills and bootlegging. And, um, but he's also uh, worked with a lot of the big, um, the big distillery companies there, uh, you know, and he's helped kind of craft and, and has been a big part of the, um, the bourbon trail that they have. Um, he got a call from Buffalo Trace. They were gonna redo uh, historic structure and they started digging around in the basement and they found all sorts of crazy things. And they're like, what is all this? Come tell us, come look. Um, and they actually found some of the original fermentation tanks from when the, the um, distillery opened in like the 1800s. Um, so they worked with him to do the archeology span and to like really learn a lot about their history uh, and the history of, of um, bourbon archaeology, like bourbon uh, distilling here in, in Kentucky. And um, they actually refurbished, they, they re, they, they're, they're using one of these old fermentation tanks. They like rehabbed it and, um, and they're fermenting there now. So it's kind of cool to see. Um, so, you know, we're definitely carrying on ancient traditions, even by uh, having a, a nice uh, brewed beverage here tonight, right? This is uh, carrying on cultural practices that span thousands of years. Um, there's been a lot of interest in experimental brewing recently and um, you know stories of this happening from all sorts of different places all over the world, all sorts of um, you know getting the old yeast or trying the old traditions or giving the old recipes. And um, some of the, the, the most interesting uh, kind of sites that I've seen are um, a bit of a mystery. There are these, uh, they're called burnt mounds and they're all over uh, the United Kingdom and Ireland. And um, they all pretty much kind of consist of a well and a hearth and then this trough area. And there's all sorts of speculation as to what uh, these sites were used for. Were they tanning hides? Were they making food? Were they processing animals? You know, what were they dyeing fabrics? Um, but one of the theories is actually that they were maybe brewing beer here. So there's been several projects where they've gone and, and reconstructed these types of sites. Um, and essentially they would have had to heat the rocks and uh, they would get water from the well, put it in the trough, and they would heat rocks in the hearth and the fire and put them into the liquid to try to get it up to a boil. Um, and so uh, you can see they made a lovely looking ale here uh, in, in one of these projects, but I don't think anyone who's done this is really sold that this is the most practical purpose and use for these sites. So um, there's still a little bit of a mystery. Um, we're seeing lots of commercial recreations. I think um, some of the earliest ones really, uh, you know, Dr. Dr. Patrick McGovern um, working with Dogfish Head to do the Ancient Ale series really um, sparked a lot of interest. 
and this and um, you know the, these projects continue on and um, there's all sorts of other other companies and breweries working on these things. Um, so he did the vessel sediment analysis and they recreated the, the recipes um, from several different places. Uh, Midas Touch is a, a, a Etruscan tomb and um, he, they recreated the um, the, the, the beverage from uh, Jiayu, uh, China. Um, and so now we're seeing other companies pick this up. Avery Brewing Company has done the Ales of Antiquity series. And so um, they're using archeological evidence, but they're also trying to go back and get historic um, recipes and trying to figure out what the, um, even just what the flavors of, you know, an Indian pale ale from the 1700s would taste like. Um, so really kind of thinking about going for those, those, um, those flavors and those experiences of drinking these older beverages. Um, and then, you know, as I'm mentioning, we're finding a lot of uh, alcohol on shipwrecks too. And so there's been uh, numerous projects where they've, um, I don't think the beer drinkers, maybe they have tried the beer, maybe they didn't, I'm not really sure. Either way, they've uh, gone for harvesting the yeast and using the yeast to brew um, recreations, uh, you know, maybe trying to figure out what what kind of uh, profile that the beer or ale might have had, um, and then trying to recreate them and using this the, these older uh, yeast strains. Um, and if you're I mean, yeast, it doesn't sound like it would have that big of an impact, but um, yeast really does provide a lot of flavor to um, to breads, to beers, to things that you're making with them, to, you know, champagnes and, and wines and all. Um, so, you know, you could make the same batch of beer and use totally different, you know, strains of Saccharomyces and you're going to get totally different flavor profiles. Um, so that really is kind of bringing back these flavors from, from the past. Um, recently, during uh, COVID times, everyone got really into sourdough baking and cheers to that. It's a fun endeavor. Um, but there was this cool project. Uh, it's actually kind of spearheaded by the uh, Seamus Blackley, who's the gentleman who invented the Xbox. Uh, but he got together with a team of researchers from several institutions and they um, got yeast from uh, ancient Egyptian uh, baking pots and, and you know places that they were uh, holding dough and all uh, and they brought the yeast strain back to life and then he um, baked the conical loaf you see here you might recognize that shape from the previous slide um, of the Egyptian bread that was 4,000 years old right um, and he used emery flour and he used the traditional um, kind of baking methods so um, there's a lot of research uh, with folks trying to revive these uh, old yeast strains and, and um, you know, as I say, baking with them and brewing with them and doing all sorts of things with them. So really fascinating uh, kind of offshoot of, of the research. Excuse me. So with that, um, we can go to questions.